Good morning, everybody, or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Ruth Gamble today, who's joining us from Australia, Saturday evening in Australia. And um, she's a historian of Tibet and the Himalaya with a particular interest in the environment. But uh, beyond her interest in the environment, she'll also be telling us about uh, Ranjung Dorje, the third Karmapa. This is a very nice follow up to last month's lecture. Uh, by Charles uh, Manson, who I believe I also saw in the room. So welcome, Charles, welcome back. Welcome everybody. I won't say much more. Uh, Ruth will give her a talk and after we can ask her some questions at the end. So if you have any questions, you can write them in the chat or just keep them for the end. And Ruth, thank you. Thanks again for joining us and on to you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, I'm, I have to tell you that it's 38 degrees it's 38 degrees here today and it's only gone down to 32 so um i'm coming in from evening in summer in melbourne i'm guessing that's a bit different to uh the weather that you're having in melbourne at the moment and also before i want to say anything else i'd like to acknowledge that i'm speaking to you from Wurundjeri land uh in nam otherwise known as melbourne and pay my respects to the uh Wurundjeri elders past present and emerging uh, and today I got asked, this evening I got asked to give a talk about the life story of Ranjan Dorje, the third Kamapa, uh, which I've now written two books about. Um, but as I, as I was just telling Jamya, um, I haven't actually talked about the third Kamapa for a few years now because I've been working on um, environmental history and environmental issues, which I actually got uh, interested in by uh, reading all of the third Kamapa's um, uh, writings, um, but it's taken me on a quite the tangent away from a uh, historical biography. So I had to revisit um, a lot of this research in preparation for this talk. And Jan Yang also asked me to uh, give you a brief overview of how I got interested in studying the Third Kamapa in Tibetan Buddhism more um, specifically, uh, the Third Kamapa more specifically in Tibetan Buddhism in general. And it's a very um, long and winding tale that uh, involves uh, snowboarding and um, uh, I don't know, the, uh, and translating and or, uh, traveling around the world and doing all sorts of things. Um, but uh, okay, to, to try and make it short, um, I started going to meditation centers in Brisbane in Australia, uh, then went traveling um, snowboarding in all different countries, got bored of that, then went to become an interpreter by studying uh, Tibetan in India, worked as an interpreter in FPMT centers for about three years and translated for um, Gagyu and Sakya and Nyingma teachers when, it, when they came to Australia because there was basically no one else. Um, so I got a good education <laughs> through uh, um, being the only Tibetan interpreter in town. And then I went and did a PhD in um, in uh, ANU in Canberra, Australia. And I would, did I did my honours degree, which is kind of like a short um, master's degree that we have in Australia. So we don't, we, we get paid by the government instead of paying to, to do the degree. That's basically how it worked. And um, I did that on Milarepa and I was going to do my PhD on Milarepa. And then um, I, I found my friend Andy Crittman's um, a PhD and then didn't know what to do. And someone handed me, and it was, it shows you how long ago it was, it was a DVD with Ranjun Dorji's um, collective works on it. Uh, and I put the DVD uh, the, into my computer and started scrolling through it and thought, and got completely, um, by, by the collection of poetry, I was completely uh, enamored straight away. So I started working um, really quickly on those, on that poetry. Um, and then through his poetry and the, his guru particularly got interested in his um, namtas. And uh, the, the, then for me, the kind of combination of the poetry and the namtas or the life stories really worked well together because I got the sense that um, the namtas gave me an outline of his life through like through time, like this happened and this happened and this happened. And then the, the guru, the songs that he would sing, made he, he kind of stopped and looked around him and told you where he was in a place. He'd, he'd write about the mountains he could see, the plants he could see, the, um, the people he was interacting with. So I, I really got a sense that these two things uh, worked well together. The stories kept you going through his life and then the poetry gave you some time to sit back and reflect uh, on uh, what he was seeing around him and gave you an insight into that. So I think maybe that's enough about, definitely enough about me and maybe enough of a, a preamble. Um, so I'll just get into, I've got some pictures 
um, because it, hopefully that will give you some hope, hope you get some hope you, help you get some focus uh, while I'm talking and I'll just uh, bring them up right so I'm going to be so basically run through the third Kamapa's life Rangjin George's life um, adding in some of his writings and and also trying to give you a background to some of the historical um, elements the, the stories um, that were the biggest story that he was involved with in. And, okay, all right. So this is actually an image, it's supposed to be an image of the third Kamaka's toes, which um, uh, I'm sure that there's a yogic reason for, but they look a bit, um, I, I'm not sure it's a, a, a proper representation, but in the middle of the image is him along with um, the first Kamapa to uh, his right and the second Kamapa to his left and then he, he's sitting in between them. They're all in this image wearing the black hat, um, which I'm sure Charles told you uh, last week is, uh, became the emblem for their lineage. Um, they became known as the Lamas who wore the black hat. And um, Ranjan Dorje in his lifetime became many things as well as the third Kamapa. He was also came from a really, as, as we'll go through and find out, he came from a really humble background. He was a, a potter's son. His parents uh, didn't own any land and moved from place to place, an itinerant potter's son. He was recognised as a reincarnate, where a, a young si, when he was very young. He became a monk also when he was very young and uh, he talked about maintaining his, um, his uh, vows in his entire life. Um, who's a yogi or uh, who practiced tantric yoga and, and was very dedicated to this and wrote many poems and discusses in depth his yogic practice. He was a guru, uh, a lama, not uh, too many um, students who went on to become um, a, a great gurus themselves, but also to uh, no less than the emperor, the last emperor of the Mongol empire. He was a traveler. Um, sometimes unwillingly, who moved all around Tibet, but also you know, into the mountains over in, he, he traveled through Kham in the east of Tibet, and then later in life made two extended trips uh, to, the two, uh, to the two capitals of the Mongol Empire in the, the Yuan Mongol Empire, the uh, Chinese section of the Mongol Empire in uh, Dadu and Shangdu. Dadu is a means great capital and it's what they used to call Beijing and uh, uh, Shangdu you may know better as Xenadu uh, which is we had a uh, uh, developed a reputation and particularly through the romantic poets in the 1900s and also Marco Polo I should say and he was a writer he was someone who can who wrote so much right that that's that it's um it's kind of I remember getting that DVD with all his work on it and trying to figure out how one person had written that many things uh, in one lifetime. This is someone who was continually writing poems. Starts writing poems when he's about five and is still writing them before in the weeks before he dies. And then he also wrote um, big works that were trying to um, uh, coordinate and synthesize all of the different uh, tr Buddhist traditions that he'd been introduced to um, in his lifetime. So there's big consolidatory work and then there's really small personal poems about how he's missing people or how, how or some little insight that he had um, in, in his uh, meditation. So you get this vast array of different uh, things that he's writing about. I, uh, the other one's um, Chulen, as Young was saying, that he's worked on this, uh, these uh, methods for taking the essence from all of the different uh, foods and and uh, substances around you. He also wrote. He he developed a calendar. Uh, he wrote on. Um, he re he rearranged um, the life stories of the the Buddha into a I think collection of Jataka and inserted some that were that he apparently found that weren't in the tradition. So there was a lot going on there. A lot of a lot of um, a lot of production and uh, a, a written production. And he did it all with. I kept. I, because uh, this is because this is me. I keep wondering at the fact that he did this all without coffee. So um, the thing to uh, uh, remember that the other thing that's really important about the Kamapa is the third Kamapa is placing him within the line of Kamapas. He referred to himself as uh, the third to wear the black hat crown. Um, so he always ha had this association as being a continuum of 
uh, his work being the continuation of both the second Karmapa and the first Karmapa. Um, so uh, these, these, this lineage of these uh, three, three men and their connections between them was built up over the years of each one's uh, lives. And, and the third Karmapa in his work does a lot to kind of consolidate this tradition of reincarnations and the stories of reincarnation. So he writes the first Kamapa's uh, life story, the second Kamapa's life story, and then his own life story and makes connections between them. And then um, he also uh, refers back to the first and second Kamapa's a lot in his poetry and his writing and in his life stories. And so that you get a sense that he's um, totally um, in, in meshing his life into their story, that their story becomes his and um, his becomes theirs. So um, just to give you a brief overview, because I'm sure that you may have got some of this last week, um, uh, the last month. The, so the first Kamapa, Tusum Kempa, um, his name, Tusum Kempa, means Nora of the Three Times. Uh, and this is part of the reason he, he was called the Nora of the Three Times is because he remembered, he, he told stories about his past life. Uh, told stories about his past life, told stories about other emanations that he had that, that were living at the same time as his emanation as the third, as the first Kamapa, as Chusum Kempa, and that what, how, where he would live in the future or the lives he would take in the future. And he came, he, he, he was born in, in Kham, which at that stage was not really a center of a lot of uh, Buddhist um, monasteries and so on. It was, a, it was a, um, out of the like population centers of Tibet, um, but he did come from a, an influential family. And he was born at a time when there was a kind of the second dissemination of the Buddhist tradition from India, where people had gone to India, um, collected Buddhist teachings, brought them back from Tibet, and you had kind of a competition and consolidation between these and uh, different lineages. Um, so who, who that people would see their Dharma or their lineages as being, they would show how they worked through their charisma and through their teachings and through their practices and so on. And you also had at this time that these lineages were associated with clan, uh, clans uh, or big family groups who are associated with monasteries. Um, and so they, the, the, the clans would promote the monasteries um, and also promote their charismatic teachers. So the, in the first come up as a story, life story, you see him making associations with these, uh, these um, powerful families and powerful monasteries and, and sometimes um, telling them to calm down, um, particularly Lama Shang, who was around Lhasa um, and interacting with all the different people of the time. And the other, the one of the pe first people who his relationship I find most interesting, his relationship with them I find the most interesting, was Pakmo Dru Doji Gyalpo, who was another, along with uh, Tusum Kyampa, he was also a student of Gampopa, who was the founder of uh, the largest Gargu lineage in Tibet and um, was doing very well in this kind of comp competition and consolidation of the different traditions. And Pagmodru Dorji Gyalpa was also called Tusum Kempa in a lot of his texts uh, because he also told stories about his past life and his, uh, his um synchronous uh, reincarnation or ma manifestations and what he was going to do in his future life. So they both were given this title um, and they seem to have had something of a, like a storytelling competition between them uh, where one would tell a story of a past life and the other one would say, well, when I was the king of the monkeys or when I did this and there was a, and, and they're very much like Jataka style um, stories of past lives. And I, and I really want someone to do a PhD on this. So if you know any young people who, who are bored or um, have uh, enormous backing that they can go and do this research for ages, I want to read the book about First Kamapa. So someone needs to write it. Um, and particularly his relationship with these other yogis that he was hanging out with in, um, in, in, in uh, Gam, Gampo and writing these stories. And, and they seem to be challenging each other to be better yogis and so on. And then after this comes Kamapakshi, who I don't, I know I don't have to tell you about, but I do want you to read this book um, that I've actually been reading as well, which is Charles's book about um, uh, the second Kamapakshi, because he's been working on it for so long and knows so much about him. Uh, but just briefly, he was again born in Kham. Um, he studied at uh, Nyingma and Gagyu monasteries. He was associated 
um, with the, uh, the associated with Tusum Kemper and kind of, I mean, Charles can definitely tell you much more about this, but he, he, he was seen as a reincarnation, but not as, in as direct a way as, as the a third come up or as Ranjan Georgi would be. And my favorite story about um, uh, Kamapakshi is that he had a, he managed that, and this is in Charles's book, he managed to have a disagreement with Kubla Khan and got away with it because uh, having studied a lot about the Mongol Empire, there wasn't many people who managed to have a fight with Kubla Khan and, and live to um, see another day. And so I think uh, that this is an important backdrop to Ranjan Dorji's story and actually puts this into like one of the biggest uh, biggest stories in human history, really, um, that these these two Lama's uh, life stories are co connected to. And that is the story of the, um, the Mongol Empire. And at this stage, uh, by the time the, the second Kamapa was going to visit, first of all, um, Kublai Khan at his, uh, in his camp near the borders of Tibet, uh, in the, and then he leaves him and goes off to Karakoram to the Mongol um, capital to teach his br older brother, who was a, uh, the head of the, the great Khan of this entire region, um, and Kar Karakoram, this, they were at this, the center of uh, international trade and these places, um, they were kind of like a cross between like, um, say something like a cross between Oxford and the UN, right? Um, Cause you're all in the UK. So I'll use Oxford as an example. There's all of these people coming into these cities, bringing ideas and stories and uh, trade from all across the entire Eurasian continent. Yeah, this is the Silk Roads came through these places and um, they became legendary because of their, the wealth that they attracted, but also the people. So the, the, the uh, uh, Kamapakshi went there um, to Karakoram, but it wasn't just him. There was great, uh, there was people with great, uh, who were renowned for, the, for their knowledge from Baghdad and from Russia and everything. They were all coming to these places as well. People were discussing, there was uh, not just Buddhism, not just Tibetan Buddhism, but also uh, Christian traditions and Nestorianism, uh, the uh, um, uh, Islam, it, it, all of these different ideas were, and Taoism, all of these uh, different ideas were being um, put into contact with each other. Different languages were being spoken. It was an incredibly cosmopolitan space uh, that these people came in and, and, and actually they were big proper, particularly the ones that uh, Ranjan Drogi went to, big proper cities. And this is one of the few times that we have in Tibetan, uh, more, Tibetan stories until like the 20th century, people involved in big cities talking to us about big cities and what it was like to be in those big cities. So that's the kind of uh, the uh, lineage background to the third Kamapa's life. Um, but his actual life stories, when they start telling his life stories in the, there's a, in the Hidnam Tars, he writes about himself, like the Rangnams. He doesn't actually call them Rangnams, but like the self, his autobiographies. Uh, he, they always, they don't, none of them actually start with his birth. They start with a description of him living in the Tishita heaven and then making a descent to earth from Tishita. So, I mean, this is clearly a reference to the image I have on the right is the uh, descent from the sheet of heaven. And as far as I can tell from the style of the painting, this is one of the 10th Kamapa's images. But it's, it's a very traditional story that the Buddha himself descended from to sheet of heaven, came down into his, into Maya Devi's womb. And this is the story about how his life story starts. So all of the life stories of the third Kamapa start in a similar way. Um, he isn't, he, he doesn't say that he's destined to be the future Buddha. In fact, there's a twist on the tail, right? So it starts with the same kind of setting, but the story is a bit different. So what happens in this case then is he's, he's meditating in Tashita heaven and he's actually there because he's being prepared to become uh, the sixth Buddha uh, of the age. So after Shakyamuni left to earth, his, uh, his regent, was put in charge of Tashita, which was Maitreya. And then they say that, the, that when Maitreya comes down to earth, that the next regent who will be the sixth Buddha will 
take over from him. And this is Simha, which the stories say is a future emanation or a future, uh, yeah, future emanation of the Kamapas. This is what this tradition says. Right. So what the story starts with him meditating in Tashida, doing the work to prepare to become the sixth Buddha. And he's deep in meditation when his meditation is interrupted by 25 earth spirits from Tibet who all manifest in front of him and tell him that he needs to take rebirth on earth as the third, as, as being the third Kamapa. And he's really not into it. Yeah, he's, he keeps telling them off. He's like, he, he says things like, you've got to go and find someone else to make prophecies about because I'm this isn't happening for me. I've got enough to do. I'm here doing this meditation. And then he also at one point tells them he doesn't have the speech to do it. He doesn't, he doesn't have the interest to do it. And then they keep having more manifestations and keep singing him more songs and requesting again and again and again until he finally is like, all right, just if I agree to do it, will you go away and leave me alone? Yeah, so it's basically like they, they pester him and put on this amazing show so that he will agree to come back to earth uh, and, and, uh, and take rebirth in Tibet. So then the story, he, he starts descending a, a rainbow uh, ladder. Uh, he's going into a space where there's, it's very, uh, it sounds like the, the earth is described as being almost like a tantric body with rock white and red channels and so on. But he descends down this ladder. And then the way that he describes it is that everything goes dark and he feels like he's being squished by a hundred rock and he loses conscious. He, it, well, there's a big debate actually, because he says um, he's lost consciousness for a second, but then the later, um, the later uh, biographers say he didn't really mean to say that because if he'd lost consciousness for a second, then he wasn't a completely uh, realized Buddha. So there ends up being a bit of a debate about that. But in the original one, he says he lost, loses consciousness for a second. It all goes dark and he's trapped in his womb and he's just really miserable in the womb. And it's kind of always struck me as being quite fascinating because you have all these people who are like trying to do regression and feel the comfort of the womb. And uh, the third, and Ranjan George is describing his experience of the womb as being some kind of version of hell. And he really hated it. He's like, you, you, he feels, he said, every time you tried to move around, things fell on you and uh, you, you couldn't move properly and so on. So eventually he escapes uh, the womb and is born to his parents. Uh, he's born in a place called La Deb, which is uh, in, um, I've got a mentor, in the, in the, Oh my goodness, sorry, it must be the heat. I've got a mental blank on the name of the valley. <laughs> um, but it's uh, it's one over from Tingri and I used to live next to the people who are all from there. They all now live in Dharamsala. <sighs> anyway, Ladur is the, is the um, province, but the, there was one specific valley, Ladeb, it's like, and also uh, where Milarepa was born as well in that area. Anyway, next to a mountain right down the south of Tibet, two over from Tingri, next to, uh, yeah, and um, so it, it right, right near the, what the border is between Nepal and Tibet now in, in, uh, and, the, and hopefully the name of the place will come to me in a second. Um, so actually, no, there, that's where it is. Can you see now on the thing, even though I can't, I can't remember the name of the mental <laughs> Still can't believe I've got a mental blank on this. Um, I actually used to live in like this village with the people from this place and I'm really blanketing out on it. All right, so right down near the border, he's born there and his, but his parents take him when he's really little from there to Tingri and later stories change it so that he's actually born in Tingri but the earliest stories say that he's born in La Deb. Um, and then Tingri, he is, he, he kind of scares all his relatives because he's so precocious. And so his parents, his parents are some of the most, I think his parents are some of the most interesting people that I've come across in this early literature because they're not the people that you usually find in these stories. Um, usually you find, you know, um, princes and princesses or people from posh backgrounds or so on. But these are itinerants and who seem to get drunk quite a bit as well. So, so they go into the town and they're trying to boast about their kid at one point and say he's really great. And he comes to the notice of a, um, of a local Lama because the parents 
uh, get drunk and get him to try and perform tricks by guessing what people are thinking. So it becomes like a parlor game. Uh, but then the local llama recognizes that this is actually a special, uh, special child and sends the parents and him to go and see Ogempa. Uh, now Ogempa, I don't know if anyone's come across Ogempa before, but he's there's a lot of good, really fascinating characters in this story. And he's another one of them because uh, Ogempa uh, was one of the most well traveled Tibetans for this age. And he had gone, his, his story, he's written, um, uh, his, his uh, student wrote his biography and explained how he traveled to Swat Valley and to India. Uh, and he got all of these teachings and then he'd come back and, and then he starts arguing with the Mongols, uh, the Mongol princes uh, as well. He's a bit, follows Gamapakshi in that regard and Gamapakshi and he become kind of friends who are both, they're, they're definitely friends, but um, they both have this uh, tendency to not do what the Mongols are telling them to do. So, and, and I think this is something that, I don't know, it's easy when you're reading the biographies of people to forget because they're so kind of charismatic and powerful and they're so respected within the religious world. It's, it's, it's easy to forget that you're dealing with, you know, the Mongol emperor. Yeah, this is like, you know, it was a really big deal. One of the most powerful people on earth with so much wealth and so much influence. And so he's, uh, Ogempa, is, is said to have whacked the Mongol emperor's um, uh, ambassador who came to get to see him. He whacked him on the on the bottom with a, a whip and a, a yak whip and told him to go away. He was like incredibly disrespectful of these people. And he was so known for being such a kind of a, a amazing yogi that he got away with that. Right, so I think that this idea that these people are getting away with this behavior says something about the respect and the charisma of the people involved in this. So he'd also previously recognized two other yeah, young people as being the reincarnations of Gutsangpa, his teacher, and Gutsangpa's partner, um, Gunchok Droma. I'm, I'm pretty sure that was the name. I've got a, yeah, uh, it, a lot of names to remember in this. Um, and it's been a while since I researched it all. So but he recognized both of their reincarnations. Um, and that, those uh, reincarnation traditions and, and uh, rebirth lineages didn't keep going, but he had already done a little bit of it already. Oh, Etienne's just told me it was a Kidron Valley that where he was born. Thank you so much. Um, yes, and I literally lived in, Et in uh, Kijong, uh, in the, with people from Kijong in Durham, so that's been embarrassing, but thank you very much for that. Um, yes, uh, anyway, going back again. Um, so uh, Ogempa had, uh, had recognised these two pe young people as being reincarnations, and this had given them kind of a kickstart for their um, uh, teaching careers, and uh, then it, it was kind of, um, understood that he could be the person to go to if you had a special child. There was a chance that he could recognize he could recognize your your child. So um, the lama that met Rangjun Dorji's parents uh, told sent them to Ogempa. At the same time, Ogempa had his own story with the he'd he'd met the second Kamapa and the second Kamapa had given him his black hat and said, "I'm going to be reborn. When I'm reborn, please." Uh, re, re hand, hand back the black hat to me in my next life and look after me. So you have these kind of different threads to the story coming together as uh, the young child makes his way towards Ogempa. And so uh, his parents uh, are taking him to meet Ogempa and the night before they arrive, Ogempa has a dream that the second Kamapa is coming to visit. Yeah, so there's all of these auspicious connections. And uh, he sets it up and sets out like a test for the young child when he comes. And he says, leave the teaching throne open. And if this is the Kamapa's rebirth, he'll walk straight up. The, he, he, he will feel like that's his place to sit. And the story is that the young child walks into the room um, and walks as if to go straight up to the teaching throne, but didn't quite figure out that he, uh, he, was, a, he was little. So he can't get up the steps at the side of the teaching throne. He keeps slipping down and basically has to clamber up uh, and to get onto the throne. And when he gets onto the throne, he's like, you have, I believe you have my hat. Please go and get my hat. 
and sends uh, and um, Ogiempa sends a, 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 a one of his uh, stu his students off to get the hat, and he brings the hat back and puts it on his head, but he's so little that it falls over his eyes. <laughs> So, so, but I love the fact that they've, they've remembered all of this detail in this story of his recognition from, from such a long ago. And this story is retold in both Ogempa's and uh, Namta and in Nandran George's story from different angles. So he's recognized, he's recognized by um, uh, Ogempa and he stays with him for a few years and he's trained and he, and he's kind of becomes like his, his child. Uh, he, he, he helps, uh, raise him for several years but at that time Ogempa actually gets caught up in a dispute between two uh Kublai Khan on the one hand and the Chagatai um and Kublai's um region in in Tibet um the who took over as Kublai's um guru after the second Kamapa um and uh Chugyal Pakpa, who's from the Sakya tradition, and he gets caught up between, they are having a massive fight with the Chagatai, um, uh, Chagatai Mongol Empire, and there ends up being too much fighting in the region, so um, they send the young Rangjun Doji, almost, as if, almost like a refugee, from Latu to Surpu. Now, Surpu was the major seat of the first and second Garmapas. Um, Kamapakshi had, um, had restored it and put a lot of work into it and his family were, all, were running Surpu at this stage. Um, before, so, so you had this kind of um, tension because there was monks from Surpu Monastery, particularly Lama Nyenre and Dharma Dumpa, who uh, had this, uh, really wanted, had connections to Ogyempa, um, had connections to, uh, it seems like they had connections to uh, the Nyingma tradition and um, Ogyempa was teaching both of these traditions and they um, they wanted to bring Rangjun Dorje to Tsurpu, but it, the second Kamapa's family weren't as enthusiastic about him coming. So eventually he's brought there, but there's some kind of, he's not welcomed by everybody in the monastery. Before he goes, he is he's uh, made an, a novice monk and he's given the name Ranshan Dorje, which was Kamapakshi's secret name. So that's making another connection with him. And he leaves Ogyempa's retreat center in Butra uh, and, and arrives in Surpu. And when he arrives, there's these stories, again, more stories that help kind of solidify his, his uh, identity and his charisma. So they say that when he arrives, a, sp a spring, he makes a spring begin to flow and a stick um, uh, brings forth flowers so it, it, it comes alive. And this is supposed to be a symbol of renewal. And this, this kind of is a kind of a trope or it's a, a part of a story that's in a lot of different stories when other people go to other places. Like I just was a few a couple of weeks ago, I was in Thabo in Spiti, and apparently um, Lotsawari Jinbanko did exactly the same thing in Spiti. He, when he came there, a spring arose out of the ground. Uh, so it does seem to be something that's associated with powerful people coming into, into these places. So he comes, he does, he performs, he performs kind of miracles um, in making that go, but they're still in making the spring flow, but they're still not 100% happy that he's there. So well, instead of having him set up shop and become the abbot of Tsurpu, I can, hope you can see this photo because this is the main temple of Tsurpu. And there's a little white hut right up on the hill at the back. Can everyone see that? Because that's basically where they send him. <laughs> he goes up into the, uh, into the little hut above Tsurpu Monastery, um, which is like a retreat center. And he stays there with his teachers, Lama Nyinri and Dama Dumpa. And he stays in retreat there with them for almost 10 years. And he studies with them. He does meditations. He uh, um, and learns and, and, and he learns about, particularly about Mahamudra while he's in this retreat center. And this becomes like the kind of mainstay of his personal practice throughout his life. He's uh, consistently enthusiastic about Mahamudra. In, in throughout all of his teachings and he's 
this enthusiasm for Mahamudra and this kind of tr- enthusiasm for Mahamudra's transformative ability comes through in uh, the works that he dedicates to it, but also his songs and from a very young age. And I wanted to actually just share a, a excerpt from one of these songs that he has when he's a, a kid. He's, he's like, I, I can't figure out the exact dates, but he's between 10 and 12 uh, when he writes this song or has a, has a dream in which Saraha tells him this song. So Saraha, also known as he calls, who he calls the great Brahmin, was one of the lineage siddhas that uh, his teachers, 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 teachers um, and took a, 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 a learned yoga from and was said to have um, inspired uh, the people that brought these teachings back to Tibet. So he, he has a dream that he has a, uh, has, a, has a teaching directly from Saraha, has a, has a um, vision of Saraha and Saraha imparts to him wisdom through this dream and he wakes up and writes this uh, writes down the song that Sarah Hall told him and it goes it says in part it's quite long but this is just a couple of uh, excerpts from it child of the lineage hear this the guru the great brahman saraha is your mind's nature it is a grave mistake to look for him elsewhere and then I, which being Ranjan Georgia, replied to the voice saying, Emma Ho, the guru, the great Brahman, is my mind's nature. And in this mandala, where variety has one taste, there are no seekers and sought. My two friends still search, while to me, sitting here alone, the great Brahman reveals a sign. Ah, how wonderful. This is what I said. This is what I said. And then he hears from the sky the voice of the great Brahman, who says to him, this is the guru, the great Brahman. I am your mind's nature. And in this mandala where variety has one taste, there are no cultivators nor things to cultivate. Hey, child, this doha, this poem, is beyond speech, thought, or expression. So cultivate it. It's a vice. Hey, child, Mahamudra is the essence of all past, present, and future Buddhas. Stay uncomplicated. Hey, child, in effort- effortlessness, effortlessness, naturalness, a state free of extremes, realize self-aware wisdom. Its purpose is to help wanderers. Don't be distracted. Stay balanced. E ma ho. Mind's nature is simplicity. It comes from nowhere and has nowhere to go, just like a crazy person. So this, I mean, I found this poem super fascinating when I first came across it because there's, it's got these two different lineages of poetry in it, right? So the, the songs that the, uh, Indian Siddhas sung were kind of there was a lot of puns and paradoxes and um, and uh, things that are meant to make you almost like Zen poems right that make your brain go what's going on here yeah so it comes from nowhere has nowhere to go um, and uh, is beyond it's beyond speech thought or expression so cultivate its advice right these kind of contradictions and paradoxes in them there's a lot of them in the in that tradition. And the uh, Tibetan gur, which are the songs sung by Tibetan yogis, they tend to be much more kind of straightforward, right? They, they tell you stories, they tell you to look at your mind and they play with the uh, sounds and, uh, and so on. Um, it, like you get the you know, repetitions of sound. But here you have this kind of combination of both of those traditions, the Indian tradition and the Tibetan tradition. And it's ostensibly written by a teenager, a young teenager um so and and i can't i mean i can't find i can't find evidence that it's not do you know what i mean like you know there's a lot it's really kind of easy to be skeptical but there is like a colophon saying this was written in this date in this place when he was staying above super monastery so i don't know if someone finds for me that it was written later um that's fine there's other things that were written that are ascribed to him that i'm not so sure about but that one I can't find any evidence that it wasn't him. So I always found that super fascinating. This insight into, you know, a direct realization, uh, a, a direct teaching on the nature of the mind from a, a great Siddha from India at, at such a young age. And, and I think it was this kind of experience that enabled him to develop the reputation that he did um, later in life. Okay, so having... Um, those kind of uh, experiences, staying in the monastery, being uh, away from the monastery but not in it. Um, he does this until he's uh, finished his education kind of at about 18 
Um, and at that stage, he gets given full ordination uh, uh, and travels to study at Sankul Monastery, which is kind of the uh, it's a, the uh, place where people go to learn the sutras and philosophy at this time in, in, in Tibetan history. And then after that, he starts traveling and he travels all around um, calm um, and into what becomes his favorite part of Tibet, which is Gongpo, which is the area to the south of the Alon Sampo in between, now in between Bhutan and Arunachal Pradesh and, and Tibet. Um, so when he's in these places, he, he, first of all, he goes to the Kamapa, the other Kamapas, uh, the first and second Kamapas monasteries, and he's allowed to, again to stay near Karma, but not in Karma, and starts another retreat center near Karma Monastery. Um, so the three monasteries associated with the first and second Kamapas, but Circle Monastery, um, Karma Monastery, which is where they get their name, the Kamapa, and then another one called Kampo Nenang in Kam. And it's really fascinating because when he goes to Kampo Nenang, they don't actually even let him in the building. Um, the, in the biography, he's walking up towards the building and then he's walking away from the building. <laughs> and, there's, and there's nothing about him having stayed there. So um, there was clearly tensions within the lineage about what you do with reincarnations at this stage. And so he starts building new sites. He um, spends a lot of time in Gawakapo, in Southern Kham, um, and uh, writes uh, guides to seeing that place, as, uh, seeing that mountain as a sacred site. Uh, travels all of, around these places, spends a lot of time in Sadi, which is a sacred site on the borderlands between Arunachal Pradesh and, um, and Tibet. Now it's on the borders. Um, and so and it, like he's kind of on the edges of society trying to stay away from all the trouble that keeps brewing in central Tibet at this stage with all of the politics and the Mongol princes and the and the Sakya leaders all you know there's a, there's a lot of um, politics and strife in that in those regions um, and also he he kind of does his circles and stays in the mountains and at some stages he comes back and stays near Tsurpo and this is a period of like 15 years in, and he stays um, next to Tsurpo in another retreat center he starts called Dechen Deng and in Tichin Deng, and then in these places, he writes longer um, works, including his some of his most famous commentaries and most famous works, including one, uh, The Profound Inner Meaning or Sabmo Nangdun, um, which is, uh, I, I don't know, I feel really weird talking about this, right? Because like I am far from being any kind of guru or practitioner or anything. Um, and, and if you want to know about Sabmo Nangdun, you really need someone who knows what they're talking about. Um, but yeah, uh, so, and I shouldn't say but after that. Um, it, just briefly though, it, it really gives an overview of all of the different way, the physicality, the uh, subtle, body, subtle bodies, and it talks about um, uh, different paths and it's all of the kind of sets it's almost like a textbook uh, for how to practice tantra is the only way I can think of to describe it so it, 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 what what the body is that you are relying on to practice it what that means for physiology uh, what that means for the way that you should see the world how the different traditions all can kind of fit together um, it's a really it's a really fascinating uh, work and uh, beyond my um, realizations or understandings to be able to explain much more about it than that. Um, but yeah, if you, I, I reckon if you're really into Tantra that you should get someone to teach that to you because it's an amazing work. Anyway, he does that. He also um, writes commentaries on other works, including the Kala Chakra, which he gets really into and doesn't just get into the idea of the Kala Chakra Tantra. He also gets into uh, what it says about astrology. Um, and he uh, starts, he, he creates his own calendar, which the Tsurpa Monastery still follows, and it has a different Lothar or a different new year um, to, the, um, to, the, to the mainstream Tibetan Lothar. So, he, yeah, he develops his own calendar. And there's also, this is the bit that I can't find evidence for in the early works, but other people say it's, it's part of the tradition. There's a story that he at one point during this period in his life, um, has a vision of Gurumche and receives a therma, and this becomes the Gama Nintik uh, therma tradition. So I can't find anything in his works that talks about this, and the earliest I could find something was a few 
um, uh, like a few lineage generations later that someone says that he had a vision of it and he's the origin of it. Um, so yeah, that's, I can't find historical evidence for it, but what do I know? I don't, oh, yeah, it, it could be happening in other ways. I'm not sure. Yeah, so there's a lot, as you can see, there's a lot of kind of work in terms of writing and teaching and traveling and everything in this middle part of his life. Um, and in that middle part of his life, one of the things that he's the most renowned for is uh, he wrote an aspiration for, Ham for Mahamudra. Again, uh, this Mahamudra is a big part of his, um, his uh, life and he keeps teaching about it and talking about it. And this one is often uh, recited at um, prayer festivals or in, in Kamakagyu monasteries um, a lot of the time. Um, at, at most, of, most days it's recited. Um, I, and I can just, I'll just read the first half of it um, and I'm sure that you've come across it before. So it, it says in part, pure thoughts and deeds are snow mountain sources. May their streams, collective virtue, descend unpolluted through the three realms and join the ocean of the Buddha's four bodies. For as long as it takes to achieve this from life to life in the succession of our lives, may no one even speak the words misdeed or suffering. And may we enjoy the ocean of happiness and virtue. May we have free time and opportunity, trust, enthusiasm and wisdom. May we rely on good teachers, extract the essence of their advice and achieve results as we are instructed without obstacles. May we enjoy the sacred Dharma in all, my, in all our successive lives. Learning scripture and reason liberates us from the veil of ignorance. Contemplating advice destroys the fogs of doubt. The clear light of cultivation clarifies the way things are. I might just skip over that bit because I'm running out of time. Um, but the, um, over the second bit. So he, he, it's a, he, he's very good, I reckon, the third Kamapa at saying these things really clearly and directly. And in that way, it is a bit different to those, uh, the paradoxes that come out in, in the Indian tradition when they're talking about Mahamudra. Um, it's very uh, kind of, there's an earnestness to his writing that um, uh, it, it kind of, the earnestness in his writing seems to mean that he, he doesn't come across as being kind of, um, I don't know what's the word I'm looking. He, he, I'm trying not to be rude about other because so, a lot of time other writers are like, "I'm really great, and this is how I've I've, uh, I've discovered everything." And I think in the third Kamapa's work, he's he's kind of so earnest about his uh, experiences and his dedication to Mahamudra that it kind of takes away from the the, the kind of the boasting that you sometimes find in, or shouldn't say boasting, the celebration of success uh, that you sometimes find in other writing. Anyway, um, so but he clearly. He kind of, it, throughout his writing, seems to be uh, working towards creating a name for himself, but then at the same time running away when he, he does have too big a name. But this, he comes unstuck with this uh, towards the end of, further in his life, when he comes to the attention of the Mongol rulers who uh, seem to have gotten sick of some of the infighting that's happening in Tibetan um, communities. So they decide that they're going to put, put forward an alternative to the Sakya tradition as someone who could be a, a, an alternative power centre. And they pick him and invite him to uh, the capitals, Dadu and, and Zenadu. So he tries to run away from it. Like they ask him to come and he takes years to accept and he keeps staying in Gongpo and trying to um, do tricks with them so he doesn't have to go. Uh, probably tricks he learned from Ogyempa. But eventually he does go and he leaves uh, for Mongolia and the two capitals, Dadu, Beijing, which is in, clearly in northern China, and Xanadu. Um, and he goes and lives there for several years. And it's almost as soon as he gets there, he's trying to figure out how to leave. Um, and he keeps asking the emperor, can I go? Can I go now? Can I go now? And the emperor's like, no, 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 no. Um, because the emperor is getting him to do things like predict earthquakes and calm people down when there's a riot and uh, help him build a, mon uh, build a temple. So he's got him really working busily, but um, it, Rang Chun Dorji is not a big fan of either of these capitals. So, but he eventually convinces them to let him go back to Tibet if he gets them uh, Tsechu or long life water. And the Mongol kings are really into anything that, that will make them live longer because they seem to keep dying quite young. 
Um, so he's allowed to go back, get this special water from a Gurumpiche uh, cave in Chimpu. And when he's got that, he tries to, to stay in Tibet um, and he organizes for a, 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 a version of the Gangur um, and some of it to be written in gold, which he's used. He brought funds back from Mongolia. He gets that organized while he's there. But eventually Togun Tumor comes and gets him and is like, all right, that's it. You're coming back now and makes him go back to Xanadu and Xanadu and Dadu. And so he keeps writing poems about Xanadu and Dadu and how much he doesn't like them and he keeps trying to leave. And then he tells the emperor, um, he tells one of his students, if the emperor doesn't let me leave, I'll figure out another way to go. And then the way the story is told is that his, the way that he actually figures out to leave is to die and be reborn in Gongpo. So he's like, you may be able to keep me in this world, Emperor, but hey, I've got some tricks up my sleeves and I can get out of here in, in other ways that you can't comprehend. So he, he, he dies in, um, in Xanadu after having a hot, he, he goes, he's sick, he goes to a hot spring and there's these real like descriptions of sitting, him sitting in the hot spring and, and looking out over the, uh, over the trees. And then he goes and uh, after that, the, like two days later, he sits down uh, in front of a, a Buddha, goes into meditation and, and instead to, and, and dies in, in meditation, in, sitting in front of the, uh, the Buddha image. Then there's all of these kind of miracles, um, which are kind of in the story, they're kind of like, I told you so miracles, right? So the, the, the king really should, the emperor really should have listened to him and let him go back because then this wouldn't have happened sort of thing. So he appears to the emperor's bodyguards uh, as uh, his image in the moon and, and different people witness it and come back and tell the emperor. And then uh, one of the emperor's um, uh, att attendants or, or, or ambassadors has ridden off somewhere and is coming back. And he says that he meets the Kamapa who's on a horse with a caravan going back to Tibet. And, uh, and he says, where are you going? He said, I finally got permission to go back to Gongpo. And then this ambassador comes back into uh, Xanadu and finds out that the Kamapa has died. So he's like, but I met him on the road. He's on his way to Tibet. And so then this kind of sets up uh, for the search by the Kamapa's, uh, the third Kamapa, Rangjun Dorji's students, not uh, the second Kamapa's family at Serpu. The third Kamapa's students go looking for the fourth Kamapa. Uh, and uh, they they actually they, that's a, kind of the first search party uh, for a tuku as opposed to someone who's recognised um, by his and his parents' will at the beginning. So yeah, so he uh, leaves behind Zenadu and head back heads back to Kongpo on the southern border of Tibet. So I don't know. This is kind of you can get some sense of the distances that he traveled. So La Deb right down here on the border is uh, where he was born uh, on the border of Kathmandu and Tibet. And through his life, he travels all around. He doesn't really go to Western Tibet. And, and there was kind of fighting and uh, problems there. Um, and, and, and Ogyempa had been there. So it's interesting that he doesn't, but all, of, all around Eastern Tibet, then up through uh, Wutai Shan, to Zenadu and Dadu and then back to Tibet. So it's quite quite the distance that he travels in that lifetime. And his last poem um, that he writes in Zenadu a couple of days before he dies, it says uh, he, he really didn't like Zenadu. <laughs> and the poem says, in dark times like these, to benefit both yourself and others, followers of the Buddha should hear this. Now you are free from Samsara's mud, strike out for Nirvana's dry shore. Now you've abandoned worldly relatives, rely on sacred spiritual friends. Now you have stopped pointless chatter, recite secret mantras. Now you have stopped debauched exertions, exert yourself at dhyana or meditation. Now you have renounced sweets, rely on samadhi's food. Now that you have stopped hankering for towns, wander in mountainous borderlands. Because when we don't do these things, external appearances become expert in deception. Children of the mind, they are crazy in the head. Preconceptions proliferate and last longer, but virtuous friends become increasingly rare. Ignorant veils and folds get thicker, and we wander on multiplying cliffs of depravity. Unwholesome friends lead us to prison, the three bad destinations where we will wander with our end. So it's a very different take on Xenobu. <laughs> All right, so... Um,
that's the story of uh, Ranjo Doji, and thanks for listening. Thank you so much for everything, and best of luck with all your other projects. I believe you're working on a book on the Brahmaputra River, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Sounds very yeah. interesting. And so best of luck with that and all your environmental uh, studies of the Himalaya as well. It's thanks. nice to see somebody with such wide spanning interests and all. So thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you, Ruth, again. Thank you.